Welcome back everyone to week two lecture one descriptive studies. So um, descriptive studies come in two broad classifications uh, in terms of descriptive data analysis. We have quantitative and qualitative uh, descriptive analyses. So quantitative uh, statistical analyses result in statistical summaries of the observations themselves. So this is quantities. So you're going to get things like means and standard deviations. So you might, for example, uh, use them on a survey to describe forced choice survey responses. So the percent of teens who were employed. Whereas qualitative descriptions um, are observations and words and themes. So when you do qualitative analysis, you're looking for words, themes, that sort of thing in the data. So you might, for example, describe a focus group's responses to open-ended questions, um, trying to develop themes that emerge interviewing a group, for example, of working teens, what it's like to be a working teen. So not so shockingly, descriptive studies uh, describe things. So they summarize and describe the characteristics of some group, person, phenomena, and there are five types we're going to talk about today. There's case studies, naturalistic observation, also called field research, systematic observation, archival research, which is kind of fun, like that, that for example, is a uh, analysis of uh, folks who uh, jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge, which side uh, in the frequency. And finally, survey research, which does end up getting its own lecture. So case studies are in-depth studies describing specific individuals, groups, phenomena, or behavior through documents, could be interviews, and it could just be out there doing observation. So it's not necessarily the case that case studies are done in their natural setting. For example, you could do a case study of someone who is no longer alive. The goals of case studies are to illustrate some phenomenon of interest. So if you think about Watson back in the day, he's a behaviorist. Um, he wanted to demonstrate that uh, fear of fuzzy white things would generalize to other fuzzy white things. And so he did a case study of that. The video is actually up on uh, YouTube. It's awful <laughs> what they did to this kid. Um, <clears throat> another goal might be to demonstrate the effects of some intervention or technique. So for example, you want to demonstrate one approach to treating uh, agoraphobia is to give iPods or, or music um, to folks who have agoraphobia and see if it uh, I'll, they gain access to the outside world, being able to use uh, that sort of intervention. If you wrote that up, that would be a case study. And the third reason is to provide evidence to examine or develop a theory. So some good historical cases of this, Piaget, for example, developed his theory of cognitive development. Uh, those stages, watching um, his nieces and nephews at play. So there are methods of case studies. Specifically, we're going to talk first about interview strategies. So um, interviews come in two flavors. There's structured interviews where everyone gets the same questions. And there's unstructured interviews where questions are more individually tailored to the people you're interviewing. And so um, they usually start with some base questions, but uh, the interviewer is allowed to sort of deviate and move around and ask follow-ups, etc., with the unstructured. So focus groups, for example, are when you bring in a small group of individuals who have some sort of common characteristic and you interview them in a group setting. So we did a focus group when I was at DMV of multiple DUI offenders uh, who somehow kept ending up with their cars that were uh, junked, even though they were impounded. And we wanted to figure out, like, how are these folks getting their, their cars back? And so uh, we brought in um, some multiple DUI offenders. We brought in tow truck drivers, CHP, uh, some folks who worked at salvage yards. And we interviewed them and looked for uh, sort of answers and themes about how they were getting their cars back when they were supposed to be impounded and sold. And it turned out uh, 
there was sort of this deal going where they could buy their own cars back. <laughs> that was a short story. So there, there are some issues in case studies. They're not particularly appropriate for doing hypothesis testing. They are good for developing theories or describing some sort of really rare, unusual, noteworthy condition you run into. For example, Phineas Gage, the guy who I don't understand the full story, but basically was working on the railroad and something blew, something like dynamite blew, and it put a spike through his head and it changed his personality. There he is in a picture. Uh, feral children, you know, like Mowgli. So uh, if you wanted to describe that sort of situation, that would be a case study. Split brain persons, where they, they still split the brain for severe seizures, for example. So the next type of descriptive study is naturalistic observation, again, also called field research. And these are descriptions of behaviors and social processes in their natural setting. So the goals of naturalistic observation are to provide a complete and accurate picture of the settings, events, and the persons involved. So you want to give the, the full picture of what's going on. So it's a lot of work, actually. But again, they're not for testing research hypotheses. Another goal is uh, objective interpretation of the events that occurred without some sort of prior hypothesis. So again, you're trying to be objective about what you're observing, record everything, write it down. <clears throat> so it's generally exploratory because the purpose is to describe something rather than explain or predict specific behaviors. So you're just describing, not so shockingly, it's a descriptive type of study. So you usually do not manipulate variables in naturalistic observation, but sometimes they do. Um, I worked with a lady on her master's thesis where she introduced uh, different objects to the cage at the Sacramento Zoo for the orangutans and saw, uh, observed how they reacted, recorded everything, etc. She was looking specifically for acts of aggression. And so she was manipulating whether it was food or a toy or that sort of thing. So you do take measurements, um, but you're not trying to find causes of behavior. Again, these are generally for developing hypotheses, not for testing them. So some methods, you immerse yourself in the setting that you want to study. That is how you do a case study. So you, uh, if you were interested in furries, you would go to a furry convention or a furry party or whatever furries do. You would observe everything, take field notes, you would want to talk to the key people involved in being a furry. And you frequently actually have to limit the scope of your observations because there's so much going on that you need to sort of limit things down to just the behaviors that are the most relevant to what you're interested in for your study. So the data are usually qualitative. So you're coming up with themes of things you see rather than quantitative. You're not getting means, you're getting um, general themes of things. So the, the chat roulette was this thing where uh, you could go on the internet and randomly meet up with someone else who had a webcam back in the day. And um, uh, in terms of doing a descriptive study on there, it, it was quite interesting um, sort of uh, what, what what was going on on, on chat roulette. So I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> I think it speaks for itself. So there are also some issues with naturalistic observation. Do you want to be an active or a passive participant in the phenomenon you're studying? So active participation, which is also called a participant observer, you actually do become a participant in the group or phenomena you're studying. So if you're studying furries, you would, you know, be a furry um, while you were studying it. So um, the Rosen Hahn 1973 psychiatric study is a good example of this, where he sent eight grad students who faked sort of vague syndromes to different psychiatric hospitals throughout the U.S. And um, they were participant observers. They were actively participating and uh, it resulted in a, a mean of about 19 days admitted, including Rosen Hahn himself, if I not mistaken, but they were indeed trying to uh, actively participate to see what it's like to be a, a mental health hospital patient. So one of the good things about being an active participant is you, you get sort of the inside look at the situation. So you get, you get to see more what the true situation is like. 
one of the downsides of being an active participant is your measurements tend to be biased. So you can lose objectivity, which is also called going native, because you're, you're experiencing the thing that your uh, participants who you're observing are experiencing. Um, you tend to interpret things less objectively, and that's called going native. So the other type of participate uh, patient is to not participate. It's called passive participation. And that's where, you know, you're still observing the phenomena, but you're doing it from the outside. You're not actively participating. So if you wanted to look at car culture, for example, you could go to rallies and shows and just observe what you see at, you know, car rallies and shows, as opposed to active participation would be buying a car and, you know, getting it all souped up and maybe even participating um, in uh, the, the uh, activities that go on. So that would be uh, an active participant. So passive participation, you tend to get more objective sort of data out of them, but where they sort of fail is that you're less likely to get a true understanding of the behaviors because you're not participating actively. So in terms of issues continued for naturalistic observation, there's the whole uh, idea of whether you conceal your purpose or presence, um, whether you conceal the fact that you're there, whether you conceal the fact that you're there observing them specifically um, is an issue you have to wrangle with. If you do not conceal yourself, uh, folks know they're being observed and it can lead to something called subject reactivity. And that is when the behavior you're observing actually changes because they know they're being observed. Kind of like, um, oh, do I have an example? Oh, okay, the Hawthorne effect, fine. So the Hawthorne effect is a classic uh, effect in experimental psychology, specifically industrial organizational, where no matter what these, these folks did at this light bulb factory, um, it, it improved the uh, light bulb making rate of the folks for a while, but then it sort of went back down again. So it's, this is also called the novelty effect. Um, another one is uh, when you're at work and they do, uh, I've, I've had them do a, a, a study of what I do th throughout the day when I worked for the state. And um, I got to tell you, those were my most productive days ever. There wasn't a minute of downtime uh, when the HR people were recording what it was like to, to do my job. So concealment, on the other hand, that is hiding your uh, purpose or presence can lead to ethical issues because uh, it lacks informed consent and privacy or collecting information. Uh, on folks without them knowing that they're giving up that information for a study and uh, you're also typically not getting informed consent because then you're not very concealed, right? So ethical issues is the, is the reason. Um, so the good news is uh, people quickly habituate to the fact that they're being observed. So we did a study with car cams with teenage drivers where we would actually put a camera uh, in their car and it would record both forward what was going on on the road and also what was going on um, backwards in the car uh, um, <clears throat> where people were sitting. And uh, initially they were pretty stiff, but I got to tell you, after about two weeks of uh, the cameras being in these teens' cars and them driving around, they, they were chatting on the phone, picking their nose, doing all sorts of things in the cars they weren't supposed to do. So it does seem like they habituate pretty quickly to things. So you don't always have to conceal yourself to get good data. So if you're observing animals, one uh, issue is called anthropomorphic, anthropomorphic thinking. And this is when uh, you're interpreting the behavior of animals and giving human motives to those animals. So my dog, for example, barks at strangers to protect me because she loves me. That's why she barks at strangers. So if, uh, if I, I'm, I'm attributing human motives to my dog and really it could just be because I feed her and, and pet her, right? So finally, we have cultural relativism. And this is just uh, uh, the fact that we, we, we grew up in different cultures. And so when we are uh, interpreting other cultures, behaviors and actions, we are doing that through our own lens. And so uh, we can make interpretations that are uh, inaccurate because we're interpreting other cultures through our own lens. 
So uh, one of the gestures up top there uh, means victory, and the other one is actually something not so nice, but it's uh, not very common in the United States. And so if you were interpreting this culture, they both look like <laughs> victory, you know, to me. So uh, um, again, cultural relativism. So third type of descriptive study is systematic observation. So this is kind of the, the craziest one. And this is when you carefully observe one or more specific behaviors in a particular setting. So the goals of these studies are to describe specific types of behaviors in a setting. They tend to be less global than naturalistic observations, so they're more focused on specific behaviors than naturalistic observation, where you're trying to just sort of record everything that's going on. So again, usually the researcher is interested in just a few specific behaviors, and those behaviors are quantifiable. So these are going to result in uh, uh, quantitative data. So the researcher will frequently have hypotheses about the behaviors that they're going to observe. So they sometimes use sampling methods. So because you're looking for quite specific behaviors, um, and there's usually multiple people or animals or whatnot, um, sampling methods are sometimes employed so that you can actually handle what's, what's going on in front of you and actually measure things in a meaningful way. So continuous sampling is not that. Continuous sampling is that you just observe for a time period what's going on. You record absolutely everything that's going on um, throughout that time period. So if you were to go to a playground, for example, and for an hour and you just tallied all the aggressive acts that you saw uh, among the kids, you would be doing continuous sampling. Um, problem is, it gets kind of crazy and there's multiple kids and um, you're trying to track everything and so how accurate is this? So sampling methods uh, probably improve your ability to accurately record things, but it does slice it into um, not the whole sort of picture at one time. So there's time sampling, for example, where you record behaviors only at specific times. Um, one type of time sampling is called time point sampling, where you record behaviors at specific time points. So for example, um, every five minutes you record if there's an aggressive act going on at, at the playground. Instead of continuously recording, it's every five minutes, look up, record, you see an aggressive act, done. Time interval sampling is sort of a twist on that, where you record behaviors during pre-selected intervals. So for the first five minutes of every half hour, you tally the number of aggressive acts. But notice that it's an interval of five minutes, not just a point um, where you just, uh, uh, lift your head and record what you see and put your head back down. This goes on for five minutes um, every half an hour. So there's also event versus individual sampling. Individual sampling is recording groups behaviors one person at a time. So for example, for three minutes each, uh, which is actually called a time interval individual sample. So uh, you record each person's behavior one at a time, but each person you record for three minutes each. So for the kids, you would say record the number of aggressive behaviors for a single child for three minutes, and then you would switch, next kid, three minutes on that kid, then next kid for three minutes, next kid for three minutes. So that is your sampling method is to do it individually, but um, you're doing it inter, uh, an interval of three minutes each kid. So then there's event sampling where you record your descriptive data only when specific events are happening. Sometimes this is all you can do. So let's say you are interested in uh, shoplifters um, when they're arrested, and you want to dis or, or you want to describe the uh, the environment of a, a vandalism site. You can't do that unless shoplifting has occurred or vandalism vandalism has occurred. So you have to do event sampling, where you sample only when specific events occur. Some issues. Uh, you have to come up with a coding system, and it needs to be simple because you're recording, you know, for example, aggressive acts. You need to have a very simple way of recording that information because you're both observing and recording at the same time. Another issue is interrated reliability. So, if more than one person is recording, you have to ensure that the uh, 
the either the recorders or the folks coding, say, a video, for example, are doing it the same. So in this example, you've got uh, one, three twos and then one person given a five. So that person has low inter rate reliability um, because uh, uh, they're clearly not giving the same score for the same behaviors. So almost final, we have archival research, and this is fun. Um, and occasionally someone will do their dissertation using archival research, and it's kind of recommended because all the data is already collected. This is analysis of records or artifacts to answer your research questions. So you're going back in time and looking at things. The goals is to use existing information or artifacts to study past behavior. So you're looking at things in the past. So this is a, a plot of suicide rates, for example, in the United States. Uh, among males um, way back in the day up till 1959. You can see there's particular times when things sort of were very high in the late 20s. You can see suicide rates were kind of high for all age groups. In fact, it's a peak for all age groups. Um, and that was the Great Depression. And then you can see other times when the suicide rates were particularly low uh, except for 75 years and older, and those are uh, from, uh, looks like, for the mid-40s, or the early 40s, and that's because World War uh, II, everyone was out fighting and um, not, not committing suicide, apparently. So you can use these to test hypotheses. So, uh, for example, here's a graph from a friend of mine at the uh, Department of Developmental Services that shows... Um, how their caseload from 1993 to 2007 changed. Um, the two lines are autism versus intellectual disability. And one of the hypotheses uh, about the increase in autism that we, in prevalence that we've seen is that it's really just reclassification of intellectual disabilities as autistic. Because, uh, you know, autism, there are ways to... Um, uh, improve your child's outcome with autism. So the thought was that indeed um, folks might be going for an autism diagnosis plus there's actually more money available for help than intellectual disability. And looking at the plots, it does appear that uh, the, the at least some portion of the increase in autism uh, in California is accounted for by reclassification of intellectual disability. You can see one's going down, one's going up, and they tend to coincide. So what are the methods? Well, <clears throat> uh, you got to find some data. And this can be anything from statistical records, so like US Census data, for example, uh, the BRFSS uh, survey of, of uh, high schoolers, uh, the famous study by uh, Neil Durkheim of suicides in France. Uh, you can look at survey archives. Again, there are surveys that are done like every year and have been done every year for you know, 20, 30 years uh, of the same group. So you can look at, at changes over time in groups. And that's like the BRFSS, which I, got in, I can't remember what it stands for, Behavioral Research Something Something Survey. Um, but uh, they look at uh, teen behavior over time. And you can look at uh, drug use or suicidal ideation, those sorts of things have changed over time. And their data is free and it already exists. You can also look at written records. So you might do an analysis of letters or sort of uh, news article topics, that sort of thing. Um, then there's physical traces. So physical traces are sort of what's left over um, from events or occurrences that you use as, as data. So you might, for example, um, for my class, identify what material thought folks thought was the most important by seeing where they underlined in the textbooks um, in the bookstore looking at used textbooks. Or at a concert, for example, or a, a street race, you might look at where folks, uh, what, what folks left behind in terms of trash from the crowd, or uh, you could look um, at tire marks on the street to figure out what sorts of behaviors are going on in street racing. Those would all be physical traces. So content analysis is one specific type of archival research where you systematically study the information that's available in written documents. So you might, for example, study suicide notes and come up with an analysis of the 
the reasons that folks state for ending their lives in suicide notes and how maybe those change over time. So when you do content analysis, there are two types of content that you're looking for. One is sort of manifest content, which is the obvious, you know, what the words say <laughs> on the surface. We call that manifest content. Um, so you might, for example, count the number of positives and negative adjectives that folks use to describe their life situation in these suicide notes. And that would be just counting what's literally on the surface, and that's manifest content. The other type of content is latent content, where you are looking for hidden, sort of like innuendo or sarcasm, that sort of thing. You're inferring it from the material. So uh, because sarcasm might help you uh, identify hidden motives, uh, what's really going on, thanks, you know, that kind of thing. So uh, again, manifest is what's on the surface in terms of the content. Latent is sort of the underlying sort of hidden um, um, meaning in what you're reviewing. So there are some issues. The big one, and I actually re had to redo my dissertation proposal because of this first one. The uh, records can be wrong, biased, or incomplete. So in my case, I was doing it on crash rates, and uh, at some point during the, the time period of my study, and it was a, a historical study, so it was, it was archival, so I was looking at a long period of time, they changed the reporting threshold for crashes in California. So initially, uh, they had to be, uh, I think it was like $750 or more, you had to report it. During my study, there was this sort of weird drop in crashes, just total crashes, and I didn't understand why um, until I, I found out, oh, they changed the reporting threshold so that you didn't have to report a crash unless there was $1,000 worth of damage at some point. So the data were just garbage. I couldn't do a, a longitudinal analysis, and so I actually had to go back, redo um, my dissertation proposal. So be aware, check the data before you get too deep. Um, because the records can be wrong, biased, or incomplete. So your interpretations of historical records or what caused changes in those series, like I just did with the suicide rates, saying, well, that was the Great Depression and that was World War II, um, can be flawed. So we can make uh, mistakes when we do that because we don't understand fully the historical issues involved. So, for example, this is a very, very famous plot of uh, the, the width of, of these uh, lines is how wide Napoleon's army was as he was marching to Moscow. The, the tan line is on the way there. The black line is on the way back. And it sort of looks, you know, as an outside observer, that he just got butt kicked on his way to Moscow um, and then just sort of ran uh, with his army's tail between its legs on the way back. But the reality is most of the attrition, that is the shrinking of the width of the tan line and the black line, um, was due to other causes having nothing to do with the battles. It was hypothermia, they were getting diseases, they were uh, starving to death, all those sorts of things were the actual causes. And were you to say it was battles, um, you'd be wrong historically. So the final type of descriptive study is survey research. So survey research is the use of questionnaires or interviews sometimes uh, to have people provide information about themselves to you for your, your dissertation or study. So uh, survey research is very popular for dissertations and it also has some of its own sort of issues regarding how people respond and how many folks you need to sample. Uh, how many, uh, uh, whether they use response sets. And so it actually is going to get covered in its own lecture. So that is coming up. Hope this was useful.